Welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and katanas presented by Bolin Media. I am Ross Bolin Sama here today with Cade Oris Sama to digest and discuss the eighth episode of Shogun from Hulu slash FX titled The Abyss of Life. Reminder, Barrett is taking care of some business out of town this week, so he's out. And our producer, Cade, is filling in for him, and we really appreciate Cade stepping up. Thanks, Cade. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here again. And quickly, before we dive into this episode of Shogun, give us a follow on social media, if you would, please. We are at Oysters, Clams, Cockles on Instagram, at Oysters, Clams, and Cockles on TikTok, and at Clams and Cockles on X, formerly known as Twitter. All right, you ready to dive into this thing, Cade? I'm ready. Let's do it. Episode 8, Cold Opens with Toranaga and all his people riding into Edo so that Toranaga can begin mourning the loss of his son, Nagakoto, who passed away after a tragic slip and fall last week in Episode 7. Uh, Yabushige comments that cracking his head on a stone was not a death he had thought of and tells his consort to be sure and record it in their book, which I assume is a book of ways to die that he is putting together. Right, yeah. He says, I'd rank it lower than boiling, but higher than eaten by dogs. So is he ranking it based on, like, the worst way someone could die or, like, just, like, how he would kill someone? I don't know. Based on the boiling and eaten by dogs comparison, it was really hard to tell what he meant by that. Yeah, because I feel like I would put, if it was ways to, like, kill someone, I feel like I would put being eaten by dogs above. Bo- both of these seem much worse than cracking your head on a stone. Yeah. Boiling alive, like we that, saw that one guy right. do. Or being eaten by dogs, I also assume would be kind of a, a long and drawn out, painful, horrifying experience. Right, and because like when he did, when he boiled up that one dude, he's like, he wanted to like hear the final moments of that person's death. Yeah. I feel like you don't really get that with the cracking your head open, but I, that you, you do for sure if you're getting eaten by dogs. Yeah, but Shige's a weird dude. Yeah, he he's a weird cat for He's sure. a weird dude. Uh, Psyche, Toronaga's half-brother who betrayed him and joined the Council of Regents in Episode 7, will have his army surrounding Edo to ensure Toronaga does not escape until he has concluded his mourning period, which is customarily 49 days you are allowed to mourn. I don't know why they didn't just go with the round number of 50. Yeah, I'm not sure how they came up with that number, but... 49 days, though, that's what you get. And this seems like quite a loophole. Like, really, he's about to be shipped off to Osaka, in all likelihood, to die, Mm -hmm. Toronaga. But his kid slips and falls, and now he's got 49 days back in his hometown to think shit over. Yeah, a lot of time to mourn. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, you know, I guess... Losing a son probably takes a while longer than 49 days to fully recover. But it's just strange that they get a window at all. They weren't like, oh, sorry, that really sucks. Yeah, sorry for your loss, but you got to come to Osaka and we got to... You got to take care of business, especially if you're psyche. Like, hey, he was trying to kill me when he slipped and fell. Yeah, I don't think he really deserves uh, to mourn his son, but yeah. So he gets 49 days and then psyche will deliver Toronaga and his people to Osaka. And Toronaga is not looking good. He's like half slumped over on his horse, coughing as he rides... Mm -hmm. Did you think he was, like, faking this at all? Like, the possibility occurred to me. Yeah. Like, you he's know, just doing a bit? I mean, at this point, and especially with this episode, as we will get into it, um, it's really, really tough to read this guy. Like, what's real, what's not? Like, over the course of this episode, over d- several different scenes, it really does feel like he's actually given up. Mm-hmm. But then in the end... Maybe not. Yeah, the cough seems to go away. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really ca- I couldn't tell, but it did occur to me early on, like watching him riding into Edo, like, is he really, is he sick? Or is he just really upset about the death of Nagakoto? That didn't really seem like all that realistic to me. Cause it, yeah, I don't know like, how you would get sick from that, but like, yeah, it seems like he just wants like everyone around him to think that he's like, he's getting weaker. And on his last leg. Yeah. 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 Uh, Blackthorn rides up and says he is sorry for Toranaga's loss, receiving only a glare from Toranaga in return. And then on behalf of Toranaga, Totemariko gives Blackthorn his journal and the logs back uh, for the completion of his service. The two books that were taken by Rodriguez out of Blackthorn's ship 
back in like episode two. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the things that incriminate him. Yeah, right? but it didn't seem like anything was going to come of that. I was, like Toranaga is like seems like just completely done with Blackthorn. Yeah, so I don't know like if anything like was ever going to come of him. Like I mean, the, stuff the, the, back. those two books gave Toranaga the ability to. Uh, put Blackthorn in grave danger. So I think him giving the books back is like the official end of their relationship, at least so it would seem, yeah. right? So you don't think like this is still like Tor Tornaga like scheming? Or, like, I mean, based on the end of the episode, I do, but I don't know how this really played into it so much. That's where the, a lot of the confusion for me comes in is like this seemed like a pretty definitive, I'm done with you, here's the shit I had on you. Here's the here's the shit I could have used to blackmail you. You're, you're useless to me now. Mm-hmm. And yet, in the end of the episode, Blackthorn is still very much a part of Toranaga's plan. So, Even if he doesn't realize it, yeah, he he has no clue, obviously. But uh, yeah, um, Mariko also tells Blackthorn that Fujisama will manage his lands until he returns. So it sounds like even if Blackthorn is like, "Peace, I'm gonna get my men, get my ship, and bounce from the Japans," he still has that plot of land. Back in Izu, like where his house is, right. that his consort, Fujisama, will just manage in case he one day does return. That was the impression I took. Like he yeah. like, damn. Thought they would take that shit back for but sure. But then she also said that like she's not sure like what like the new like the new caretaker whoever takes over, whoever yeah. wins. Yeah, like if he will receive a warm welcome. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She does put that out there. Um, she also tells Blackthorn that his men, the crew from his ship, are in Edo, and must be he must be eager to be reunited with them, she says. Uh, Blackthorn also briefly tries to talk Mariko out of going to Osaka with Toranaga, obviously concerned that she will die for no reason, um, but she says her allegiance requires her to go, which is not all that surprising. So then we get the opening sequence with the music and the you know visuals, um, and after that, we're in Osaka with Ishido congratulating Lady uh, Ochiba for bringing Toranaga down. But Ochiba says, until he has his head pressed to the floor in submission, they are not free from his threat. Ochiba acknowledges that this 49-day mourning period has bought him time to remain threatening, uh, while Ishido is more like he's trying to get on with the celebration and... and uh, Marry this woman, it turns out. He suggests that they strengthen their bond through marriage. And Lady Ochiba she seems a little freaked out by him pressing her this way. Uh, does not respond. Yeah, she doesn't even like really look at him, too. When doesn't say a word. Brings it up. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, it is because of a fear of like what this guy could do and like thinking that like he might kill her if she says no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and as uh, Mariko informs us in this episode, like... Her, as far as she knows, Lady Ochiba's main uh, motivator is fear. Mm -hmm. Like, she's scared, right? Um, so, yeah, Ochiba does not respond to Ishido, and Ishido tells her that the offer is hers to consider, and then he departs. And while it might not seem like we got an answer in this episode, I think we actually did um, in the last 15 minutes there, which we'll get to. But back in Edo, all of Toranaga's men, minus Toranaga himself, who was not present, dine and remember Nagakado together. This was an interesting scene because it there was a lot more respectful th things being said about Nagakado that Kado than I expected. Yeah, I mean there were some some shots thrown at him too, for but. sure. But he was like a total clown, mm -hmm. and uh, like Bontaro says, Nagakoto was brave. Hiramatsu says he was reckless, and then Omi says that he died because he refused to accept the death that their lord Toranaga has chosen for them with surrender. Uh, Omi seems to respect that. Omi and him were kind of boys, yeah. you know. They hit the hot tub together, right? But that also like kind of confused me because like yeah, it does seem like Omi like had a certain level of respect for him, but like. No, in episode four or whatever, when like he like kind of convinced him to, uh, no, kill um, that one general with to the do cannon. cannon practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He definitely manipulated him, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that necessarily meant that he wasn't like actually friends with him. He just kind of was doing his uncle's bidding or whatever at that point. I think. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I realize they're trying to give different perspectives on Nagakato's life and death here, but the kid. 
<laughs> like he was an overzealous moron, like plain and simple. There wasn't a whole lot about him to like mm -hmm. as a viewer. Right. And frankly, we didn't get much of him outside of him doing dumb shit. So anyway, the, yeah. the, the scene of them discussing him uh, was interesting. So next we're at Nagakado's funeral, where once again, Toronaga is not present. Hiramatsu tells Yabushige that Toronaga has fallen very sick from his journey. And Yabushige is like, oh, you haven't seen him either, huh? So it seems like Toronaga's hold up in the, in the palace is not seeing or hanging out with any of his people at this point. Um, Yabushige suggests that, like he says, uh, he references the things that Omi said at the, the little dinner the night prior. Um, and suggests that they ride to Osaka with guns and cannon. Uh, after all, Toronaga's Edo generals wear their armor to the funeral to protest Toronaga's surrender. So clearly there are dudes, the generals in Edo, uh, that command Toronaga's forces are not down with surrendering. They're wearing their armor in protest of surrender. And Yabushige is like, look, we could use these guys, we can roll. Let's get the cannons, let's get the guns. Let's go attack Osaka. And, um, like, Toronagi mentions it, that, like, he was, like, upset about that. But, like, isn't that, like, just, like, a thing? Like, you know, like, military, uh, like, generals, like, will wear their, like, uniforms and stuff, like, at funerals? Yeah. But, like, I guess in, like, this case, like... But then I guess more, in this culture, that's, that's, that's not, not the, the case. Yeah. yeah, and I think doing so under these circumstances could be perceived as, like, an act of aggression mm -hmm. when they're supposed to be submitting at this point. So that's what that's what has Tornaga upset, I think. Yeah. Um but yeah, Hiramatsu tells Yabushige that he alone will head to Osaka as a condition of their surrender and that he'll be returning the guns and cannons at the request of Ishido. So as far as Yabushige knows at this point, he's going to go to Osaka before anybody else and return the guns and cannons that Tornaga has as as a part of their surrender. Um, as demanded by Ishido. And Yabushige looks very upset by this. He's like, oh, fuck, I'm going to die. <laughs> um, and we get a shot of Toronaga watching his son's funeral pier burn from a distance. And he's just kind of like cooped up by himself. Again, we really don't know what to make of what's going on with this guy at this point. Uh, then Bantaro informs Mariko that Toronaga has requested her presence this afternoon. He also requests that he be allowed to make tea for his wife which she accepts and uh, will make for a very awkward scene later in the episode. But he, just early on here, it seems like he's trying to make the peace. Yeah. And she was just like, she was like, oh, yeah, tea sounds great. She's like, I will accept. Like, sure, let's, fine, I'll drink some tea with you. Yeah, she doesn't seem capable of refusing it. Mm, no. And who is the lady she was with? Is that Toronaga's wife? wife? Yeah, okay. one of his wives, the one who had a baby that he hasn't visited yet. <laughs> well, he is sick, so, I mean, probably don't want to get your newborn sick. I get it. He's in town and... Can't even visit his baby mama. Yeah. <laughs> Sad. Very unfair. Um, next, we're with Blackthorn and Edo trying to get some charcoal for a fire when Fa Father Alvido wanders up, and uh, he's impressed by Blackthorn's assimilation into Japanese culture. He's like, wow, dude, I didn't think you had it in you. Yeah. And, like, I think he was trying to, like, he thought he was, like, asking for firewood, like Alvito was, but he's like, no, like, Blackthorn's like, no, I meant this. Like, I've got this, dude. Yeah. I don't need your help, man. Right. Um, Alvito says, uh, like, I'm not here for you, man. I'm, I'm here because I have urgent business with Toronaga. And uh, he wonders aloud what Blackthorn will do now that Toronaga has clearly cut him loose. Alvito's pretty sharp. He picks up on it. He's like, if you're living out here and you're looking for charcoal or firewood or whatever, you're supposed to be living in the palace with him if you're a Hatamoto. So you're clearly not in the inner circle anymore. You're no longer in the circle of trust, and I can see that. Yeah, Black Florence is just kind of like a lost puppy out there right now. He doesn't really know what to do. He has no clue, yeah. yeah. Um, he does say to Alvito that he intends on attacking the black ship he's heard so much about. I don't know why he would tell Alvito that. It feels like that gives Alvito an opportunity to potentially better defend the black ship um, that's so important to Portuguese trade. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like he's also, like, made that clear for a while now that he doesn't, like, no fuck with the Portuguese, obviously, and, like, he wants to take out their ship. Yeah, that's and, very fair. Alvito asks uh, Blackthorn if he will wear the clothes he is currently wearing, the traditional Japanese garb he's been given, when he sees his own men, kind of implying, like, you're kind of a turncoat. 
you're you you're on the other team now. Right. Are you gonna go roll up in that jersey to your boys? <laughs> let them see you like this. But Blackthorn's like, yeah, yeah, totally. I am. Mm-hmm. I for sure am. It's not a big deal. It's fine. Everybody's everybody's gonna be cool with it. They're gonna like my threads. Yeah, I think you're gonna look sick. Yeah. yeah. Tornaga then meets with Alvito. Uh, he also has Hiromatsu and Mariko in there with him. And Alvito tells Toronaga that Ishido has bent the Council of Regents to his will and that his efforts in their partnership have failed. Because Alvito and Toronaga struck that deal on the ship before leaving for Izu that, uh, you know, they were kind of going to partner up. That if Alvito could do certain things, then Toronaga would give him a church in Edo. Um, Alvito's telling him, like, hey, I, I wasn't able to get these people on your side. Did, did they ever show that conversation with Alvito and, like, the two uh, regents he was talking about? Was that... uh-uh, I don't think so. Okay, so. I don't think that was something we got to see. Okay, so that he could have just, like, been lying about that. It's too, possible. Like, but, yeah. But Toronaga refuses after that to speak in, in Japanese directly with Alvito, and he tells Mariko that she has to translate for him because uh, he cannot be trusted. It's almost like you only get to speak Japanese with me if I if I'm cool with you. Yeah, if I respect you. And I'm no longer cool with you because you failed to bring these other regions to my side. Uh Alvito then suggests that Toronaga form an alliance with Lady Ochiba so the heir can be free to turn against Ishido. He basically says, look, Ishido does not care about the heir. He just wants power. In all likelihood, him having power puts the heir in danger. So if you can partner up with Ochiba, then the heir will be free to turn against Ishido. This takes care of everything. Ishido no longer has a, a foothold on power. And uh, Hiromatsu, who, as we all know, is Toronaga's like, right-hand man. Mm-hmm. This is his oldest and bestest boy. One like the very few people he trusts. I would say the only person he can yeah. trust all the way, really. Mm-hmm. Um, Hiromatsu agrees with Alvito. Says uh, Osaka is not their enemy. Ishido is. And he tells Toronaga that his face wears the color of defeat and that he has given up on those who would never give up on him. Toronaga starts to get defensive. He says his son is dead. He will have no further bloodshed, that he will require a pledge of allegiance in writing from his Edo generals who wore armor to his son's funeral to promise they will march in surrender to Osaka with him. Uh, Things kind of start to spiral out of control in this conversation, and it ends up carrying over into the meeting we do have later with the Edo generals present. But again, this is a moment where you're like, is this... Is this like genuine conflict and disagreement between Hiromatsu and Toronaga? Or is it staged in front of Alvito? Yeah, so you can go and back to Osaka, let Shido and them know that like, yeah, there's like bad blood between those two and like Toronaga is like essentially giving up and like, yeah, making him look weak. He knows that he's sick too and all of that. So Right. So Toronaga tells Alvito that since he has kept his promise, Toronaga will also keep his and allow uh, the church to build a new church here in Edo. In return, though, he asks that Alvito go back to Osaka and tell them what he sees here. And he says that very specifically. Just, again, like Cade just said, very strange. Because it's like, almost him saying, yeah, tell them I'm giving up for real, for real, and me and my boy are on the outs, and like, this is, it's a shitstorm down here. We've, we're, we're fucking up. Um, so it, it becomes pretty clear Toronaga is plotting something as he wants Osaka and Lady Ochiba and Lord Ishido to see him as like weak, depleted, and defeated. And he says, uh, still in front of Alvito, all I want is a peaceful death. But when they're giving us shots of like Hiromatsu and Toronaga, Toronaga, I'm buying it. I'm buying what he's selling. I'm like, yeah, damn, like he's this dude is. Up. He's like, the death of his son was like the last straw, and he seems like he's done. And I'm buying Hiromatsu's like shock and disappointment, too, that Toronaga is giving up. Like, Hiromatsu seems genuinely appalled and discouraged and disturbed by what he's hearing come out of his uh, oldest friend's mouth. See, I, I think, like, I always kind of figured that, like, Toronaga had something up his sleeve. Like, he, again, like, he's just, he keeps everything close to the, the chest. Um, it's just been like weeks and weeks of this now. I know, and again, like I know you like trust Hiromatsu like the most out of anyone, but it's like if he like tells him like, "Hey, I'm actually gonna like go and like still attack Osaka," you you can't like be like, but I need to look like we're like there's beef between us right now, right? Because then like you have to fake it, and then it doesn't look genuine. Yeah, and then like 
Alvito might be like, oh, no, I actually think they're they're scheming. Yeah, this it doesn't seems like look, bullshit. It doesn't seem genuine, yeah. Yeah. So Hiramatsu leaves the meeting and tells Yabushige, Omi, and Bontaro that Toronaga intends to fight. And he knows this because otherwise he would not have sent Alvito back to Osaka with that message. Now, this is a very important line that Hiramatsu delivers. Because as of the meeting that just occurred between Alvito and Toronaga with Hiramatsu and Mariko present... Hiromatsu is now reading into it the way that we are trying to and say, okay, he's got something going on because there's no way he would have sent this priest back to Osaka and tell him, you know, what he has seen here, uh, to tell them what he has seen here unless he was going to fight. So based on that, you got to keep that in mind when we get to what Hiromatsu does later. So next we get Mariko entering uh, some sort of like a, a tea house, but an actual tea house, not a not a place filled with courtesans. Um, she like slides open a little window and like climbs. Yeah, it's like in. a little secret passage. I or thought something. she was like sneaking around. I, yeah. I was, that, was, that was a confusing moment. Um, but she gets in there. Bontaro meets her in there, and uh, they recite some poetry together. Then he serves her cha or tea mm. uh, as dramatic music plays. This is clearly a big deal. A husband serving his wife in this way. And Mariko seems honored, and she says, your performance was wonderful. Really good at pouring tea. Yeah. Yeah, just like uh, old, old Kiku's really mm-hmm. good at pouring sake. Yeah. Um, Bontaro tells Mariko he thinks they're going to die in Osaka regardless of what his father says, and that he remembers how happy they were in their first days together. Mariko struggles to remember herself, she says. Yeah, it she doesn't says, seem like yeah, they were actually happy. all that happy. <laughs> yeah. Which prompts Bontaro to ask her if she's still under the Anjin's spell. And she just doesn't respond, which is basically saying yes. Yeah. And then Bontaro's like, we should go to death together. We should kill ourselves. Tonight. <laughs> we should kill ourselves. Are you still are you still falling for that white boy? No response. Let's kill each other. Yeah. Let's kill ourselves tonight. Let's do this. He says, quote, I wish to finally give it to you in protest of our Lord's surrender and your enemies. Let us welcome death together. Let us enter oblivion as husband and wife. And uh, at first, this was pretty concerning because I was just like, well, first of all, damn, Bontaro's like, like we said last episode, not much is going well for Toronaga. He only has a few guys really in his corner at all. Bontaro certainly is one of them. And uh, now he's trying to get out. He wants yeah. to die. Mariko has been trying to die the whole season and much l- before it even. And uh, now she's got the permission that she's, that she, we she's, thought she wanted. She's been asking for, yeah, the, the entire season. But she says, even now, Bontaro fails to understand that what he has denied her wasn't death, but a life beyond his reach. Basically being like, no, 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 I don't want to die. I just don't want to be around you. Yeah, I don't want to be with you anymore, so I'd rather kill myself than do that. So, like, yeah, I don't want to actually kill myself with you. She uh, says, I would sooner live a thousand years than die with you like this. That's t- <laughs> it's, hard, it's harder to hear something more brutal than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she, <laughs> so she leaves, and Bontaro's, like, just starts just crying. Cry, yeah, and, like... I don't know. Did you notice like how like he wasn't like ever like facing her directly? He was kind of like, like at slightly an angle. to the side. Yeah, I don't know like what was up with that, but like that just like flagged for me, and I was like, that's interesting. Yeah, they they definitely sh- intentionally showed us that, right? They like they give you that ang- that shot where he's turned at an angle, she's facing him straight on, and I think it must have been like out of respect the the way that the conversation was going, like how they actually did it, because I was. I read an article with the showrunners, and one of the things that they spent a ton of time on in putting Shogun together was, like, the way people walk, like uh, Lord Toronaga versus Lady Maria, Tota Mariko. They walk completely differently. The women walk differently. The consorts walk differently than the other than the courtesans. The courtesans walk di- Everybody sits in a certain way, and it's all very historically accurate. Mm-hmm. So I have to assume that there is some formal reason like a social cue for why Bontaro sits at that angle um maybe it's like apologetic or respectful or whatever it may be gotcha okay yeah um but yeah so she just leaves this dude (laughs) up in his feelings it's like too little too late buster next we're with blackthorn attempting to reunite with his men from his ship um 
his guide. He's got like a guy that's like walking him as he's like, I, I know where these fuckers are. I'll show you. Yeah. And uh, his guide informs him that the men have been drinking all the sake in the region for months. Just been getting shit. <laughs> and they will be the they will be glad to be rid of them. Yeah, these dudes have just been getting white boy wasted mm -hmm. up in Edo. Yeah, that's literally all they've been doing. Clearly, haven't been been showering much. No, nope. no, they don't bathing. have great hygiene. No. The pirates, they just they just don't. Uh, so Blackthorn starts to approach the like set of tents, houses, whatever these little. I thought they were in like a whorehouse area or something. I don't really Some, know what they yeah. were doing. But he starts to walk up. Then he like picks up a foul stench. He's like, oh, God, smells like those fucking guys. He sees one of his dudes named Solomon stumble out. He's like attempting to pick up a woman. Mm -hmm. And then Blackthorn's like, uh, I, changed, I changed my mind. I'm going to head out. He yeah. turns to leave. But Solomon sees him and calls to him. And uh, Blackthorn has no choice but to talk to him. Yeah. Which I didn't like get fully because I'm like he was, his back was turned to him and like he had like longer hair so yeah, like, there's, just, there's just not that many white people right I, yeah I figured but like, I know it's dark out I'm like huh that and he's drunk I was like there's no way like he could have just like picked him out it like did that. seem a little far-fetched yeah but because you know, I do good, get it like he's a good like 30 feet away yeah I'm like I like I do get like he's probably the only other white guy he's seen yeah. out here so that does make sense no but, but to your point his back is turned you can't see much of his skin mm -hmm. he's got the long robes it's on dark out there yeah he's wearing a different get up but yeah but uh anyway Solomon tells him tells Blackthorn there are only six of their crew left and I want to say they were like 10, maybe 8. Mm -hmm. Some guys have died is the point. Some right. more guys have died other than the dude who got boiled alive. Um, I'm assuming not by like murder so much as like not taking care of themselves and not having food and just drinking sake nonstop. Yeah. Um, but he says the six that are still there are barely hanging on. And Blackthorn's like, oh, well, uh, I've gotten clearance for us to return to our ship and go home. Did he actually though? Like sort did, of. But did Tornaga say it was like oh, I'm gonna give you your shit back and then you can go and do whatever? Well he told Ma he... Mariko to tell him like here's your shit, we're done. Okay. Uh and uh your men are here. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So not really to answer your question. Yeah. Not, he's, not, like, he's not like like he's like not free to leave still or I, I don't know. I got the impression that Blackthorn actually believed what he was saying. But uh, what he was saying himself. Mm -hmm. But Solomon doesn't buy it. He blames Blackthorn for this entire Japanese venture. He even uh, goes so far as to say, like, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this while we've been stuck here in Edo. And I don't think we ever had, like, because there was that line several episodes ago where he's like, there were Spanish ships to the north and Portuguese ships to the south, and we had no choice but to go through the strait and end up at Japan. He's saying, like, that was all bullshit. You played us. You used us. A bunch of men died. This whole situation is your fault. And uh, then, he, then he fights him. He's like, take off those skirts and punches him in the face. And Blackthorn beats his ass pretty, pretty brutally. Like, he gets almost, him down on the ground. I always thought, yeah, he killed him. But I, I think he just got, like, knocked out. I think he just put him out cold yeah. but like he, he gets him down on the ground and then like in a UFC fight except if there was no referee mm -hmm. he just keeps pounding on him and uh but yeah I'm 99.9% .9 yeah. sure he stopped before the dude was dead probably should have been talking shit about the kimono no he shouldn't have talked shit on the threads yeah um it's yeah but then after it's so like Blackthorn has a line where he's like oh he's filthy and yeah. then he takes off like his overcoat is what I'll call it mm -hmm. his top layer yeah and he throws it on the guy like, here's some clothes, you disgusting fuck. And it was pretty clear, just based on the way this whole scene unfolds, I think the message we're supposed to receive is that Blackthorn no longer feels the kinship with his former crew that he once did, that he is a changed man. These people's society and their culture in Japan has, like, taken hold of him. Uh, the fact that, you know, Blackthorn was filthy when he arrived... Multiple times, they're like, hey, dude, take a bath. Take a, yeah. He's like, I took one four days ago. It's fine. I'm, I'm good. Another bath? And now he's judging this member of his former crew as filthy himself. So, like, he's been through a lot. Doesn't fit in with the British pirates anymore. Yeah. 
And again, it's like, yeah, he doesn't fit in with his old crew and he doesn't really fit in with his with, new crew. Yeah. And so again, he's just kind of like lost out there and doesn't know what to do. A man and with then, no home. Yeah. And then like, that's why he ends up going to Yabushige, which I'm, we're about to yeah, get to. Yeah. This scene is wild because the way it unfolds, like we, we just see Blackthorn talking. You can tell he's going to ask for a favor. Mm hmm. And you assume at first that he's talking to Tornaga. Yeah, he's gonna he's got, give that same speech again. Yeah, exactly. My man, my ships. Yeah. Uh, but he, or you know, tell me what I'm supposed to do as part of Crimson Sky. But Mariko is with him, and you kind of just we've seen that scene unfold so many times with him and Mariko and Tornaga, and then they they quickly show you it's Yabushige, and he asks Yabushige if he can sail for him to sail under his banner on his behalf. Um, Yabushige initially. It's, he doesn't really have, like, a strong reaction, but Omi, his nephew, turns and looks at him like, absolutely fucking not. Yeah, it's like, that's like treason, yeah. pretty much. And so Yabushige refuses and says Blackthorn is wrong to think that Toranaga has given up because one of Blackthorn's reasons is like, listen, our lord is going to die soon. So he clearly is, has no use for me. Perhaps you do, and I can sail for you. Um, Blackthorn says he may have once fooled himself into believing that he could belong in this place, but no longer. All he wants to do now is whittle what fate he can for himself to make his own fate. And he says he knows Yabushige understands that from when he saw him face death on that cliff many months ago and took his fate into his own hands by preparing to commit seppuku amongst the waves. And you can tell, like Blackthorn gives this speech, and it hits home with Yabushige. Yeah, I kind of struck a chord with them. Yeah, he's like, fucking, that's fucking right. We are the same kind <laughs> yeah. of dude, you and I. Like, he really he really identifies with that. Uh, he's taken by the similarities in their outlook. But because Omi is present and continuing to judge him, Yabushige tells Blackthorn he is wrong, and he refuses his offer as a betrayal of their lord, and Mariko is disgusted with Blackthorn as well. Like, there's no explaining treachery, she says. Um... But you, but still, you do leave that scene feeling like Yabushige liked that offer. Yeah, he liked what he heard. Regardless and, of if he couldn't accept it in front of all those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then what? Well, he also has that, um, Blackthorn has that line that Mariko ends up asking, like, did you want me to translate that? Or was, was that, that just that for me? me? And wait, what did he say there He again? said, uh, you know, loyalty, at a certain point, loyalty becomes foolish if to maintain it is suicide. So, like, he, he's saying, look, you're loyal to Toronaga, sure. Yeah. But if your loyalty takes you to Osaka on what is a suicide mission, what's the, the point of the loyalty? Right. And, and yeah, she's like, you want me to translate that or was that one for yeah. me? But I also do feel like it could apply to, like, everyone there, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just interesting that, they're, that uh, Blackthorn and Mariko, they're still, it's like they're dating secretly, Right. Because yeah. they have these little exchanges still where you can tell that no one else knows what they're talking right. about either. Yeah. And you can tell there's more to their relationship than just a translator and her, you know, employer, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we got another one of those here. Um, next, Jin, the owner of Willow World, she goes out and visits the plot of muddy land that Toranaga has set aside for her to build Willow World 2.0. My first thought was like, this is this like a bog, a swamp? What is this? Yeah, it seems like Tornado just muddy. like threw him out in like the outskirts. Like it's not like really in the city or near the city. It's yeah, just like on, yeah, just outside. a mud pile yeah. out there in the outskirts. Uh, but she's stoked. Oh, she can't wait to to get the building. Yeah, she's she's got it all mapped out in her head. Yeah, she's like smiling. She's overtaken with emotion. Uh, she's just walking out there on the spot by herself. And as Kiku explains, like this is a lifelong dream realized mm -hmm. for uh, for old Jin. And then, like a hundred yards away, <laughs> the, oh, this like seriously, awesome. a stone's yeah. throw. Father Alvido walks to the plot of land that Toranaga has set aside for his new church, and then quickly has the realization that Toranaga has given him land next to a tea house of courtesans. Yeah, I love like he asks like who who's that over there? Who are those people? It's like oh, those are your neighbors, yeah. the courtesans. <laughs> and his face just like drops like oh. He, he just goes, courtesans. Like, he's remembering, like, like courtesans equals mm -hmm. prostitutes. Damn it. He stuck me next yeah. to a whorehouse. <laughs> yeah, no, very intentional about oh, Horinaga yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. De I mean, and this is another one of the moments in the episode that reminds you, like, okay, even if we've been getting dragged along for a few episodes here, Torinaga is still 
that dude. Mm-hmm. He still knows what he's doing. He's still planning. He's still scheming on some level. The very fact that he still gives Alvito, he's like, you know what? I'll hold up my end of the bargain. I'll let you build the church here. We're just going to put that like, church next to the whorehouse. Stick right next to Willow World 2.0. <laughs> yeah. And I had suspicions that those things might come. We, we talked a little bit about this on Patreon last week, I think. Um, that the fact that he had agreed with Jen, like, yes, you can come build, but he had also made that deal with the Catholics, like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can put a church in Edo if you do some of this maneuvering for me, that that might be a problem. Well, here it is. <laughs> very next week yeah well it's honestly like not a terrible idea too because you're like you know you go to willow world on a saturday night right wake up sunday morning you got a church right there for you go get your sins forgiven exactly yeah yeah um i also like like the conversation with omi and kiku because he like asked her he's like you know like you're kind of the reason for all of this like don't you feel like you deserve more yeah like, like you got her this yeah and I mean, obviously, she's getting like a whole house to herself. So, like, she's like going to be all right. But he's right. like, you deserve more. He's like, do you think like loyalty um, to a certain point is, can be bad? Yeah. And like, she's, I feel like she says no directly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But I feel like he's also like asking himself that because he's like, if I'm like, I'm being loyal to Tori Naga, even though it's like, it's going to lead to certain die. death. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, should I like follow the same path almost? No, that was a really, really important conversation there. I'm glad you stopped us on this because when I rewatched the episode this morning to make my outline, that scene stuck out because if you pay attention to Omi, the rest of the episode, what Kiku said to him clearly took hold. Mm -hmm. Like at the scene where uh, we're about to get to it, where the generals all, everybody has to sign their name on the paper. Omi signs his name without much protest. And what, what Kiku tells him in response to his line of questioning there is, Basically, like, if you don't see what is happening, you need to look harder. She's telling him, like, if, if, you, if you can't see the plan or, like, the, she's, she's speaking in, like, general terms, not, like, related to Toronaga yeah. necessarily. But she's saying, like, if you can't see it ahead of you, like, the path, you have to look harder. And then when Omi is in that room with everybody else, you know, getting ready to sign this document saying they'll be a part of the surrender in Osaka with Toronaga. He looks hard at Toronaga. And I, in my opinion, makes the read that Toronaga is still in the game. That the things he's saying and doing are not for real. And that there's something beneath the surface he can't see, so he needs to stay loyal on some level. That was my read. Mm. So I thought that scene with Omi and Kiku was really important. and Because he's really floundering. He's like, I don't know what my fucking purpose is anymore. A lot of people are feeling this way, right? It's the same yeah, thing the, Black The vibes are very low for everyone. Everyone's Morale just like, is dog shit. Yeah, yeah, no one knows what the plan is. They all they think all... they're going to go die. Yeah. And uh, and she gives him that little like pick-me-up Kiku does related to Jin and, and Willow World 2.0. Um, and I think it really hits home for Omi. So, yeah, we've got that whole situation out there in the mud. Also, I, the church is also in the mud pit. Like, yeah. yeah but <laughs> like at they, first, before he sees the hooker house, he is stoked as well, yeah. Alvito. And, yeah, like, they cut from Jen and them to, like, uh, Alvito. I'm like, oh, man, like, he, Tori and I literally put them in the same spot. And, like, I, oh, that's, yeah, when, yeah. that's when it clicked for me. I'm like, oh, my God, he's a genius for doing like, that. Like, right next door, yeah. yeah. Uh, so then we get the shot back in Osaka... Lady Dion, who is the former wife of the Tycho, has a stroke. And this might have been tough for some of us viewers to pick up on, like, because you're just like, oh, shit, this lady's having a stroke, but who is this lady? Yeah. She's the lady from the flashback that tells Ochiba, like, you need to get pregnant Mm -hmm. from the Tycho, because I can't do it. None of these other women could do it. We need an heir. You're going to be the one to make us that heir. And she's kind of stuck around with her this whole time, I guess, as sort of an advisor. Um, but that's who Lady Dion is, the former wife of the Taiko who could not produce an heir. So Ochiba visits her, and Dion, like with her last words, basically, is like, promise me you will stop these games, promise me you'll release the hostages, and abandon Ishido. She's like, that guy sucks, he comes from nothing, he will always be nothing, he is nothing. And... She she seems Dion to tell Ochiba like this didn't this isn't it. This isn't fucking it. You gotta make another move. You gotta do something different. This is Shidu guy sucks. Yeah. And it's very similar to what Alvito was saying to Tor- Tornaga that like 
Ochiba like isn't really loyal to him. She's just loyal to her heir. Right. Um, and that like you need to like make an alliance with her and you know take out Ishido because he just wants power. Yeah, Dion doesn't go so far as to say like you need to go get with Tornaga. Right. But she's like, this is she dude dude cannot be it. Um Ochiba gives her some medicine to ease her suffering, and then Lady Dion passes away. And Ochiba seems deeply impacted by this loss. But we'll have one more scene with Ochiba that I, that is obviously very important. But so f- my point being. She seems like she is in a place to be, if not manipulated, then guided in a different direction, which is important because we know Toda Mariko is headed to Osaka, presumably to try and influence Lady Ochiba. To join with Toronaga. On Toronaga's behalf. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see next episode, the, the penultimate episode, how that all unfolds. But the scene with Dion dying seemed like a really important one for Ochiba and the prospect of potentially going a different route that is not Ishidu-based. Um, back in Edo, probably, yeah, definitely the craziest scene of the episode, right? Hiromatsu, Bontaro, Yabushige, and all these Edo generals uh, face Tornaga in their big meeting room, right? They're told to sign their names on this paper that Yabushige will deliver to Osaka, indicating who all is surrendering with Tornaga. And Yabushige signs, does not really protest or think about it. I think he's just like, oh, fuck it, I'm dead anyway. <laughs> Omi signs, like we already talked about, he gives a very distinct look to Tornaga, like he's really trying to look harder. And uh, Bontaro signs, even though they don't show us Bontaro signing, he's the third in line, you have to make the assumption that he signed. And then they get to the Edo Generals, and they refuse to sign. Now, first watch, I was like... Who the fuck is that guy? <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? But these are the guys that they showed wearing the armor at the funeral. Right. Right? It just like, in, in, unless you were really paying attention, they're like, okay, those are the Edo generals. You wouldn't have tracked yeah, them to like, this scene. Get, we haven't seen them at any other point right. during Right, because the they've been here in Edo. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, th- that's who these dudes are. They're the Edo generals that, that wore the armor to Nagakato's uh, funeral. So they're like, hey, man, we're not going to sign this. Clearly, this is a ploy basically saying, you've got something else going on, you're not fucking telling us. And we're not signing this without being in on it. And he's like, there is no trickery occurring. Tornaga insists. He says, uh, Japan is more important than the survival of their clan. Like, basically, like, there is no one part that's more important than the whole, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, And that his fight is decided. And again, a scene where, like, at face value, like, I am buying what Tornaga is selling. That you think he's just giving up. I'm like, damn, this dude is out. He does not want to play anymore. He is bowing out, right? Like, that, it really, we've been told all, the only thing keeping you from buying in all the way is that you've been told all of this about Tornaga, that he is, like, a master manipulator, trickster, schemer, and he has all this honor and, and seems like our protagonist, so it'd be pretty weird for us just to watch this whole season, and in the end, he's like, I don't want to play anymore. Yeah. And again, it's like, he's not going to tell anyone this, because they have to believe it's, it's real. Heart. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that, too. This all has to... I think part of it, to your point, Cade, is that he has to assume that there are spies. Yeah. And that there are rats. And if he doesn't sell this wholeheartedly to that whole fucking room, then it won't work. Which brings us to how the rest of this unfolds. Um, Hiromatsu, right when things are about to seemingly like erupt into conflict, even within that room, like one of the Edo generals like puts his hand on his sword hilt. I was like, "Fuck, are they gonna fight right here?" <laughs> Hiromatsu steps in and says, "Like Tornaga, if you will not change your mind, then I will commit seppuku right here at once." He says, "Because." They all think, like, they're going there to die. So he's like, I'm going to kill myself just so, like, you can, like, change your mind and, like, actually, like, go go out without a fight. I mean, this was layered. Yeah. And I think if if we are to believe what Toronaga says at the end of the episode, then, again, having rewatched it, I think Hiromatsu saw the writing on the wall, saw what was happening in this room as Toronaga's telling them, like, sign your names, we're going to Osaka, we're all going to die. These Edo generals are floundering. They don't want to sign. Other guys are questioning what's happening. A lot of loyalty has been lost. And he's like, I got to take this into my own hands. I got to do something drastic. Now, how that plays into, like, the rest of the room falling into, you know, line, 
I don't really get it. Because, like, let's just go through what happens here. Hiromatsu uh, it, it seems to me he's deflecting all the other tension and the potential conflict in the room. He's, like, pulling all of that to himself. And then Toronaga and him participate in a game of, like, seppuku chicken where he's like, I'll fucking do it. And Toronaga's like, do it then, bitch. Do it then, bitch. I'm not going to stop you. I won't yield. I'm not going to do it. He's like, I will do it, dude. I'll do it right here. I'll, I'll do it. And uh, then it starts raining. And Toronaga tells him, like, I've made my decision. Now you have to make yours. And Hiramatsu gives this great line. He said, so you do believe in pointless death, which is a callback to episode two or one. Where after that one dude stands up and defends Toronaga in Ishidu's presence at the Council of Regents in Osaka, that guy then has to commit seppuku and sacrifice mm-hmm. his son, his yeah. baby son, as well. And Toronaga tells uh, Hiramatsu, like, I don't get it. All the, the pointless death like that makes no sense to me. It's stupid. And Hiramatsu tells him, like, that it's part of a bigger whole, right? Like... There's a lot of emphasis in those early episodes on like um, basically suffering and sacrifice as as a part of something bigger, like their code of honor and the way that their society and the culture functions. And I think Hiromatsu is clearly calling back to that almost in a way to say like, all right, I get what we're doing here. I understand. Granted, me, Ross, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't fully get it. But Hiromatsu seemed like he fully got it. And he says, so you do believe in pointless death. Your vassal dies in vain. And then Toronaga says, then die. And f- so for that line that Hiromatsu said, yeah. it underlined do. Um, yeah. And like the yeah. subtitle. So you do believe in pointless death. Has that ever, have they done that in like for I other ones? I think like one or two other times. Okay. Like for emphasis, but yeah. it was, it did stand out. Yeah. For sure. Um, so Hiromatsu says, Lord Toronaga, then this is farewell. And Hiromatsu calls for Bontaro to be his second, which is fucked because that's his son. The whole the whole scene is yeah. fucked. This and is one of the B- most powerful Bontaro's scenes. Bontaro's already gone through with uh, oh, man, his wife yeah. not wanting to commit seppuku with him. He's having a day, dude. Yeah. He's having a day. Wife won't kill herself with him, and then he's got to kill his own dad. Um, so Bontaro says, uh, he like goes and kneels down next to Hiromatsu, and he's like, I will join you in death. Hiromatsu says no. So he won't die with him either. Um, he says <laughs> no. He just doesn't want, want to be around it. He anymore. doesn't. He doesn't, dude. He, he's got too much shit on. Uh, but he wants to uh, he wants to die with his dad. Hiromatsu says you will learn what it means to be told no, basically, to be denied. And tells him he must live. And very, very interestingly says, and you must never give up on our Lord even when it appears he has given up on himself. So again, to me, that indicates that Hiromatsu knows what's happening. Yeah, he's implying that he figured out what Toronado's plan was. And yeah. Like, to like, stay strong and, and you know, stay loyal to, to him. Right. Now, so Bontaro cries again, and then uh, seppuku happens, and just like it was the first time we watched it, it's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. And, 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 and they didn't even show the, the head the last time. No, they, they, no. This time we got the rolling head, yeah. though. Bontaro... <laughs> One clean strike, head yeah. gone, rolls over to Tornaga, who appears to be absolutely furious with the way this has unfolded. So again, it, either this guy wasn't quite sure, e- either Tornaga didn't even realize what was happening, and Hiromatsu did, or Tornaga is just the best actor ever. And I'm yeah. not talking about the guy who plays Tornaga. <laughs> I'm talking about Tornaga, the character, was yeah. so... Cr- if he... If he went into this knowing, like, Hiromatsu's going to have to sacrifice himself, and that's going to cause all these other fuckers to think we're totally screwed, and cause Yabushige to say yes to Blackthorn and take him up on that whole ship thing, and cause who knows what else to happen with the Edo generals and shit we haven't even seen yet, but, like, at the nothing else happens in this meeting. It's almost like, well, if somebody commits seppuku, the meeting's over. <laughs> meeting adjourned. Nobody can, nobody can protest any further, you know? Yeah. So they... It was really hard to tell, though. Like, if, if, well, like, let's just get through the rest of the episode, I guess. There's not much here. Um, so, next, Mariko visits Tornaga, who asks if uh, she disagrees with what happened today. And she is like stoic as ever. She says, It was a hard enough day. I, I wouldn't add my disagreement to the things that make it hard. Then they recite some poetry together. Again, there's like a lot of poetry yeah, this going episode, on. Yeah. Poetry that, that I couldn't uh, wrap my head around. Yeah. Um, then he says, Kind of out of nowhere. He's like, 
All right, good poetry session. So tell me, has the Anjin gone to Yabashige yet? And it's kind of like a big reveal moment where you're like, whoa. Yeah, like he knew. He knew that he would do that ahead of yeah. time. And not only he knew he was going to do that, but like they knew he was also going to take him up on his offer later. Right. So Mariko says yes, but that Yabushige refused. Toronaga says that today's events will change Yabushige's mind, which would lead you to believe that Toronaga did in fact know things would go the way they went at that meeting and that it, this is all part of his plan, right? Mm hmm. Which is fucking confusing. <laughs> like, I, as somebody who's watched the episode twice, I'm telling you, I'm still going back through those scenes. I was like, but does he know what he's doing here? Or is this just like, yeah, he is should... he actually falling apart and then it shit kind of falls together as a result? Yeah, or he's just like so good at reading people and knowing like what they're going to do. And it's just like, I don't, Man, I don't he's know. He's so many chess moves ahead then because yeah. I'm watching this going, oh my God, we're fucked. Our team's <laughs> fucked. It's over. We're screwed. We're all going <laughs> to die. We're taking the L. And this dude's like, very confident in the way things are unfolding. He's like, again, so he says, today's events will change Yabushige's mind, implying that Yabushige will now accept Blackthorn's invitation to let him sail under his banner. He says, quote, Hiromatsu made sure of it. And he says the Anjin and Yabushige are very predictable. Uh, he, he compares them to a certain kind of bird. Yeah, the, the hawk, I think. What, some kind of, I don't know, some specific kind of hawk, I yeah. think. It might, I don't know if it's the one that like he, he rolls around with. Right. Or, yeah, but that you can basically predict their moves. Kind of a callback to that that conversation he has with his son when he mm -hmm. demotes him as coach of cannon practice. Tells him you're not in charge of coaching anymore. Um, and as he's saying, Anjin and Yabushige are very predictable. Mariko's like realizing what's happening, falls to her knees. Tornaga joins her, walks over to her, drops down to his knees, and uh, says, "Hiromatsu, his old friend, knew his duty well." Like again implying that that was all fucking scripted, essentially, which is wild. You sacrifice... <laughs> like, last week I was saying there's pretty much one guy in his whole squad he knows he can count on. Well, now that guy's dead because he sacrificed him just to make some crazy fucking ruse. Like, the, some ruse. And I don't understand the benefit. Yeah, no, he just keeps losing people. And I guess it is for, like... The illusion that like he's been defeated, like oh you lost your right but hand. What man. advantage does that give him? Again, like I don't think it does. Well, well it must well, have seen clearly it. he knows how. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. But as a viewer with no further information, you're like I don't understand how this possibly makes him better off. Like all we've been given is that he clearly wants Osaka to see him as defeated. So he must have some way that if they think he's done, he's able to take advantage of that and turn things in his favor. We, I just don't have the slightest fucking clue how yet. Yeah. Because the rest of this makes absolutely no sense to me. So he says, uh, Osaka has to believe my defeat is real. Now, are you ready to do your part? And Mariko, like, they, like, zoom in on her face. Super intense. Great scene. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm ready. And her part in this is, I'm assuming, going and talking to Lady Ochiba. And... But to what end? We don't know. Right. So in Osaka, we get this very quick scene which is right after all that intensity. So you're kind of still up in your head like, God damn, that was crazy. What is Toronaga doing? Does he under, like, what the fuck? And they just show you really quickly Lady Ochiba walking into a room where Ishido is, and then she bows to him, seemingly accepting his proposal. Like, mm -hmm. he has a look on his face yeah, like, Yeah, he's like smiling. Gotcha, bitch. Yeah. And she, she looks bummed, which is weird because the... Dion, whatever lady, the lady who just had a stroke and died, told her very specifically, no Ishidu, that guy stinks. You should be out on Ishidu. But then she immediately goes and accepts the proposal, so it just, I that think, was hard to read. I think is one thing is, again, like the fear thing, like thinking that he might kill her and his son. Yeah, if, I guess. If, if he, she says no, and I think it is also a part of her plan. Like I think like, you know, staying close to him and knowing what his plans are, then like he, she can use that to that take would advantage valuable. of him later. Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. That's a great point. And I mean, you've kind of, the whole time, ever since we got really introduced to Ochiba, it does seem like her and Toronaga are kind of running parallel, mm -hmm. regardless of the hate that she expresses for Toronaga. It it has seemed like they're going to end up aligned somehow, yeah. one and, way or the other. And um, like Alvito, like in that scene with Alvito, he mentions. Like, I think Toronaga does have, like, a good relationship with the air, like you saw in episode one. Definitely seemed like it, yeah. So, like, and, like, that was kind of, like, their Ishido's whole reasoning to, like, start this war with him because he's like, oh, Toronaga wants 
to he's got kill too the much air, power. Yeah, he wants to take. And he wants yeah. to be Shogun. Yeah. Um, and like I think that was like just all based off a of lie, just so Ishio could like take power. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in back in Edo, Yabushige does indeed accept the Anjin's proposal to let him sail for him as Toronaga predicted. Um, Omi, I would note, seems to abandon his uncle in disagreement with his plan. Again calling back to the conversation he had with Kiku, I think he has chosen loyalty to Toronaga. Because mm-hmm. he's like, he's like, Uncle, what the fuck are you, what are you doing? He's like, don't ask me questions about my shit. And Omi's like, oh, farewell. Like, right, yeah, best luck, of luck, yeah. bro, but I am out. And, and uh, Yabushige throws him one of those, oh, like, oh. A, like a grunt, <laughs> yeah. and like a frustrated grunt, and then just turns and walks away, right? Um, so Yabushige tells Blackthorn that they are allies now. They... They have their bro moment up there. Yeah, They're like, all right, uh, boys, we're boys now. And uh, before they can enjoy that for long, Toda Mariko sails up, and they're like, "Who? what the fuck is she doing here? And she's like, oh, so uh, Toronaga has asked that I accompany you to Osaka, which is obviously a huge light bulb moment for both of these dudes, is they're like, this motherfucker knew. He knew we were going to do this. He somehow got us to do this. And uh, to, to, again, in their minds, they must be asking the same question we are, which is like, but why? <laughs> what is the point? What are we doing? What the well, fuck is happening? Well, they do have all the the guns and stuff, and yeah. you know if they, if he makes it seem like they're surrendering all that stuff to them, like it's there already for them to use later. Well, I mean, my guess is that Tornago's forty nine days are going to end. Yeah. Also, Psyche, does he get an, uh, like an, another forty nine days, or like does that's that, a really good question for he Hiromatsu? Did lose, yeah. I had the same thought. I was like, did he just, is this like a, what is it, like 98 days he gets? (laughs) Just the plan Total, just a plot? Yeah. Yeah. So my guess is that no, he won't get an additional 49. There's probably some rule about like, if you have, whatever. But that, they're okay, so Yabushige and Mariko and Blackthorn are going to be on a ship, which first of all, Blackthorn and Mariko pillowing uh, alert for me. Yeah. feel like there's more coming. Uh, because, you know, she just dissed her husband in every possible way, the lowest level. <laughs> I would rather live a thousand more. This is the woman who's been begging for death all season, says she would rather live a thousand more years than die with this fucking guy. I have to imagine there's going to be more of their love story on the boat. But my guess is that, so you got Yabushige, you got Blackthorn. They're on the ship. They're headed to Osaka. They got all the guns on there, mm-hmm. right? And he's going to be, like, Tornado's going to be, like, in, like, that main council room with like all of his generals maybe i don't even think it's going to get that far i think tornaga riding up to osaka with psyche and his army that that's somehow going to shift i think psyche being a turncoat and being on ishidu's side might be fake i think he might actually still be with tornaga and that whole thing is a setup so it's going to like it's going to be like have you ever seen braveheart no, I have not. Well, there's a scene where the Scottish are going up against the Irish, and uh, William Wallace is the head Scottish guy, right? And he's mm-hmm. got, like, this psycho Irish dude with him. And they're full sprinting into battle with the Irish. And right before they run into each other, they both stop, and they all, like, dap each other up and <laughs> shake hands. They're like, what's up? And then they join forces and attack the British. I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be a similar type situation with Psyche and his men. So the point being, Yabushige and Blackthorn now have a... Uh, a maritime presence in the ship. Mm-hmm. They can attack from, from sea with the cannons as Toronaga and Psyche and their forces are attacking from so land. So you think Toronaga, like, surrendering to Psyche I think was it's all, bullshit. all part of his plan? I think that's the only part that I could see being more easily readable. Everything right. else, like, my biggest question is, why did Hiramatsu have to die? If you really wanted them to think, like, you're crushed, defeated... Did he have to die? Couldn't you have faked his death somehow or something? You know, like, fuck, like, Yeah, man. I think you got to make it look as real as possible I, for... D- damn, he definitely be- sold it. <laughs> his head's gone. Also, like, I don't know. I guess, like, like on war, like, no fighting. Like, he's not going to really do much out there. So, like... He's old. Yeah. He's an old old dude. Kind of yeah, served his, his purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just... It just felt like such... Look, it plays into the whole thing about their culture that, that we've kind of questioned on and off all season long, which is, like... You know, that Blackthorn kept bumping up against with Mariko. She's like, you basically have to accept your place. You don't decide anything as an individual. You're just along for the ride. And he's like, that's bullshit. Life is valuable. 
and it should be treated as such. And like, they don't necessarily see it the same way. So for like Hiromatsu to die for this purpose, huge honor, right? Mm -hmm. Great life lived, not seen as a negative thing to Hiromatsu, but of course to us as viewers and especially with a Western state of mind, like I'm watching like, fuck that dude. What? Get yeah. one of these other fuckers to die. Why, <laughs> why me? I'm your best friend. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that's his, that's his best friend. It just, that was crazy to watch unfold. Um, but yeah, so Mariko and uh, Blackthorn and Yabushige will be rolling in the in the ship. And is Omi still with them? Too? No, Omi bounced. Oh, okay. so he's not going, and or not with them on the ship anyway. So Tornaga rises the next day. And by the way, I would note his castle in Edo, his palace is like very much under construction. Yeah, they keep We're, showing it's got like. They're, they're, they're expanding. They're, yeah. they're, they're building a lot. Renovations. Yeah, yeah. Major renovations, right. it would seem. Um, so he wakes up. He gives like one more cough. Yeah, just to you know, fake the viewers out. Right? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he just kind of bounces up. He's like seemingly much stronger now. Dresses in his full like general garb. Mm-hmm. Uh, walks out to the funeral pier where the ashes of Nagakoto Kato are still fresh. Thanks him. For buying him some time. He's not like, I miss you, son. Or <laughs> Thanks for those 49 days. Right. Really, could He's really just use like, a... thanks, dude. Yeah. This was great. This was really good to get some extra time. Uh, he says, quote, I will not waste it. Hiromatsu and you both, I will not waste it. And so we're back to the place we've been for the last 30 minutes, which is like, how, what is this plan? What is he doing? Did he know this whole time, or did Hiromatsu spur him back into a place where he's ready to fight again? Was he really sick and on the ropes, or was that all an act? How much of this was real? How much of it was part of his plan? And it's pretty impossible to know, but I will say this. I, I, you have to assume he couldn't find any other angles, because he just sacrificed his son, albeit probably unintentionally, and his best friend, just to get a little more time to finally hatch this this scheme. And god damn, it would be tight if there had been another way to go about it. For him. Yeah. I assume he would have he would have preferred a way where he didn't lose his best friend and his kid. Right. But that's just me assuming. Which as we know can make an ass out of you and me. Right. Exactly. But yeah, no, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm just trying to figure out like, you know, what actually like was part of his plan. Um, especially with like the Nagakato stuff. Like, did he like know like he was gonna do some dumb shit like that and try and attack Psyche. He could, I kind of couldn't have known though. Yeah. Like in but, that, or like that I mean, one. I guess because he did again attack um, the cannon general practice. cannon practice. Yeah. yeah. So like I think like he already has it in his mind that you know the Nike, kid does Nike, reckless Nike, shit. Yeah, exactly. And like yeah, all the other guys said that too. But he couldn't have possibly predicted that Nagakato would go attempt to kill Psyche and slip and die. Right? right, I guess he could have predicted that he might attempt to go kill Psyche and die. Yeah, just not how. But even then, like, yeah, that doesn't. It. That's why it's kind of hard not to be in what I assume is a group of people who believe that Toranaga has kind of been flying by the seat of his pants, and that Nagakato's death, which was not part of his plan, did present him with an opportunity, and that even in the case of Hiramatsu, perhaps. Toronaga did not see it coming, did not know it was going to happen, but because it did happen, he's going to use it. Yeah. Which which that one's tough to accept because it's like, God, again, again, we're back to like your best friend, man. Like, come on. But I don't know. I'm I'm assuming, first of all, this is why, as I've said in the past, I think this show will be really fun to rewatch once we've seen the conclusion mm-hmm. because then we'll have a better idea of what's happening during some of these really tricky, confusing scenes throughout the course of the season. Um but, but fuck, they have such like, we got two more, right? It's it, nine and ten. Next week is the penultimate episode, and then uh, the finale the week after that. They have put this thing in a position to be to give us a couple of really explosive hours of TV, for with, sure, with yeah. a lot happening, and uh, I'm very excited to see how it unfolds. But this was another great one, man. This was like tough to watch at different. different I mean, that scene, the scene with Hiramatsu and his seppuku was. That was intense, that was rough, man. Yeah, that was that was tough, but uh, but all in all, it was very very well done. Uh, today's episode is also brought to you by our listeners supporting our show by subscribing on patreoncom slash cockles in exchange for so much more OCC ad free. 
Uh, a reminder, Barrett and I went and watched Dune Part 2 in theaters. We recorded an hour-long discussion and review of the film, which is available to enjoy exclusively on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles. And you may be thinking, I would love to enjoy that discussion and review of Dune Part 2. You can, and it won't cost you a dime. Right now on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial. That's seven days of membership for free. And enjoy our entire discussion and review of Dune Part 2 in either audio form by joining the Clam Fam tier or have video as an option for, uh, for most of our episodes by joining the Mollusk Militia tier. In addition to our Dune Part 2 discussion and review, subscribing on Patreon will also give you access to the other movies we've discussed and reviewed over the years, like Oppenheimer, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Saltburn, Parasite, Interstellar, Joker, Casino Royale, Tenet, 1917, Ex Machina, The Talented Mr. Ripley, Booksmart, Knives Out, and more. You can see all the movies we've discussed and reviewed by clicking on the Movie Club Collection of our Patreon. And of course, patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles is also home to our entire companion podcast for every single episode of HBO's classic crime drama, The Sopranos, our weekly bonus coverage of Shogun, which we will have another one uh, coming out on Thursday this week with Cade and I taking hotline calls from the Mollusk Militia and further dissecting and discussing episode eight of Shogun as well as bonus coverage of House of the Dragon, Succession, The White Lotus, The Last of Us, Foundation, Silo, and True Detective Night Country. When you join, you gain access to our entire backlog of ad-free premium content. We are talking years of OCC that you have never seen or heard if you've never been on our Patreon. And again, right now, it's completely free for you to join and enjoy for seven days. And then it's just $5 per month for the Clam Fam tier or $10 per month to join the Mollusk Militia, where you also gain access to full video of most episodes if you're a YouTube watcher, plus the Mollusk Militia exclusive hotline for a chance to be featured on the Patreon episodes. And the Mollusk Militia exclusive Discord as well. Hundreds of hours of OCC available uh, for free during the seven-day free trial anyway. All of this while supporting your favorite podcast, What a Deal. Act now as this seven-day free trial won't be available forever again. We appreciate all of you for being here, uh, for watching and enjoying Shogun with us, and remind you that we started off as a Game of Thrones podcast way back in the day, so obviously we hope to be your go-to companion podcast when House of the Dragon returns for season two this June, just a couple of months away. Our show is available not only on all the major podcast platforms, but also YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash at Oysters, Clams, Cockles. Subscribe, rate, review, comment, share our show with those you know. Thank you very much. If you're watching on YouTube right now, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, leave us a comment uh, with your thoughts on the episode, and that will do it for today's show. Remember, again, we are available on all the major podcast platforms, but also in full video on YouTube.com slash at Oysters, Clams, Cockles for your viewing pleasure. Shout out to everybody watching on YouTube. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the show. If you're listening on Spotify, please give us five stars. For more from me, Ross Bolin, listen to the Ross Bolin Podcast wherever podcasts are played. Or watch on YouTube.com slash at the Ross Bolin Podcast where Cade is actually my co-host. And uh, you'll get more of Cade as well. Cade, where can the people follow you? You can follow me on all the social media platforms at Cade Orris. That's K-A-D-E-O-R-R-I-S. If you are an F1 fan, check out Formula Bone, Bolin Media's premier F1 programming hosted by Jared J-Bone Borislow at YouTube.com slash at Formula Bone, at Formula Bone on all the social media sites and... Uh, Formula Bone on the podcast platforms as well for F1 coverage all season long. Previews and recaps of every race. Jared J-Bone does a phenomenal job with Formula Bone and all the F1 coverage. If you're a Houston sports fan, check out Banging the Can, hosted by me, wherever you get your podcast, wherever you get your OCC. What else? I think that's it. Go to bowlandmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some merch. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We look forward to hearing everyone's reactions on Patreon this week and reading them on social media as well. Until next time. Hey! Hey! Oh!